I'll consider the theories behind industrial policy, but keep in mind there's also a video on the evidence about industrial policy. People use the term industrial policy to mean a lot of different things, but for our purposes, just think of it as deliberate attempts by governments to subsidize particular industries and firms and pick winners and losers in the process of economic development. The first theoretical argument for industrial policy relates to what are sometimes called knowledge spillovers and dynamic scale economies. What does this mean more concretely? Consider an automobile industry. If a country has a successful automobile industry, this may require that industry to be a certain size or scale. And in this argument, the government, by some mix of tariffs and or subsidies, can help the automobile industry grow to that size or scale. There's also the possibility that having a successful automobile industry brings knowledge spillovers for the rest of your economy. For instance, as an economy develops a successful manufacturing capacity, this may in the longer run help the economy get good at making other and different things. A version of this argument is quite old, and it was discussed extensively at least as early as the 19th century, and then it was called the infant industry argument. The claim there is that certain industries are in a sense like infants. They need to be fed, they need to be coddled, they need to be helped, and eventually they will grow up and be strong and healthy. A second argument for industrial policy has to do with what are sometimes called coordination failures. So again, let's go back to our example of the automobile industry. It could be that to have a successful automobile industry, your country also needs an auto parts industry. Your country may also need a, an extensive rail network to ship the parts from where the parts are made to the automobile production plants, and so on. But it could be, possibly, that maybe no single private sector individual will move first and build his part of the network because he sees that the other individuals are not investing. So in this argument, there's at least potentially a role for the government to have a kind of big push or big move forward and get everyone on board with the idea that a particular sector is going to grow and thus to help overcome these potential coordination failures. A third theoretical argument has to do with what are called informational externalities. Again, consider the automobile industry and imagine a developing nation which might have two or three potential automobile producers. Maybe the producer who goes first is the one who discovers whether or not automobile production can be successful in that country, but of course the one who moves first also bears most of the risk. So the one who would move first discovers information for a number of different producers, but you could imagine a situation where each potential producer is afraid to move first and waits for someone else to take that plunge. Arguably, some kind of coordinating policy or subsidy might help overcome this problem and help get the nation onto a path where it has a successful automobile industry. Two of the major theoretical arguments against industrial policy, they're fairly straightforward, but they're also fairly powerful. The first we can call the knowledge problem. Do individuals in a government actually know which are the economic sectors or firms which should be encouraged? After all, these are bureaucrats, and they're not necessarily in the best position to judge what will be a successful entrepreneurial venture. There are plenty of examples where governments have tried to encourage particular sectors. Those sectors turned out to be failures, and it was a mistake in the first place that the government was to think that it was the one to know which sectors really should be advanced. The second argument asks the simple question, will special interests corrupt industrial policy? So keep in mind, industrial policy is not generally some kind of objective fact-finding exercise run by perfectly honest angels in the public interest. Industrial policy is run by real, imperfect, self-interested, and sometimes corrupt human beings, and those human beings respond to political incentives. They may be caught up in a framework of autocracy, they may be catering to special interests, and very often industrial policy will be run in the interests of particular corporations or industrial sectors rather than the nation as a whole. If we're talking about problems with industrial policy, there are also two particular tests to keep in mind. They're called the Mill Test and the Bostable Test. The Mill Test requires that a protected sector eventually can survive in a pretty tough world of global competition once government protection is taken away. The Bostable test requires 
that, well, industrial policy, it may involve some costs now in the form of industrial protection, but over time, the benefits for what you're doing have to outweigh those current costs. For industrial policy to be a good idea, it actually has to pass usually both the Mill test and the Bostable test. At the theoretical level, two other questions to keep in mind. The first is tariffs versus subsidies. In practice, a lot of industrial policy consists of tariffs. Tariffs keep out foreign goods and they protect domestic firms. But the logic of a lot of industrial policy theory arguments actually implies subsidies would be a better idea. But what we get in practice very often is tariffs rather than subsidies, and tariffs very often are worse for domestic consumers than subsidies would be. The second question is that even if you've decided that some kind of industrial policy should be done, it doesn't have to mean either tariffs or subsidies. It could be that the real policy which is called for is some kind of promotion of foreign direct investment, and that could be through the rule of law, it could be through a favorable regulatory environment, it could be through a low tax regime. So the arguments for industrial policy taken alone do not themselves decide that you would prefer tariffs or subsidies over just having more foreign direct investment. This is a complex topic with a lot of different angles, and I would stress that this video has only covered a few. For further reading, I would suggest starting with the two pieces listed on this slide, but keep in mind that really quite a few of our other videos very directly bear on this question, and if you view the other videos on economic growth, the section on trade, uh, any talk of increasing returns, and also some of the videos in the history of thought section, you'll get a deeper and more detailed look at this question of what are the theoretical arguments for industrial policy?